Uh, and happy Easter again. Say, that's what happened last week. It was so quiet. You guys say happy Easter. You guys remember why it's happy Easter still? Easter season. Yeah, it's Easter season. For seven whole weeks, it's Easter season. We're still in it. What a great song to remember as, as Christ burst forth from the tomb on that Easter morning. So, happy Easter to you. We continue to contemplate the meaning of the resurrection in our lives for these several weeks. And uh, unity that we see that Aaron talked about already in Ephesians is one of the ways that the resurrection impacts and heals our world. We're going to get into that. Uh, I do want to enjoy being in person with you. And again, at home, I don't want to exclude you. You can definitely participate too. Um, But a show of hands, if you would, get your hands ready. If you would say, you had a holy week. All right, nice. Those of you raising your hands are remembering last week's message. That's good. Uh, What about uh, thumbs up if you had a blessed week? Blessed week? If you have a bumper sticker that says you're blessed. Anybody? Yeah, a couple of you? Okay, that's cool. Blessed is a little more familiar language than uh, holy. And what about double hands up, charismatic style, if you had a blameless week? I had a a week of no blame. (laughs) Fewer hands. (laughs) Yeah, if you do remember last week, and if you don't, please go listen to it uh, uh, by way of video or audio. If you heard that message as we got into this new series, Out of Many One, you'll remember that as Paul is writing into a context of division, he is giving the Jewish and Gentile Christians their single identity, which he uses the phrase, in Christ. It's probably Paul's favorite phrase in the whole Bible, in Christ. That is our identity. And being in Christ, we're being made holy, being blessed, and even being given Christ's own blamelessness. So as uh, you are asked, you know, if you had a blameless week, you can say, well, in Christ I had a blameless week. That's actually theologically true, right? Even though we're all still growing to be more and more like Christ day by day. Now, we're going to continue where we left off last week, looking at what Paul says about who we are in Christ, but more specifically now, whose we are whose we are. To get our minds in the right place, I want to start with the story of a teenage girl named Angelina. I learned about Angelina through one of UPPC's mission partners, Olive Crest. Anybody heard of Olive Crest? Good, some nodding heads and some hands. Good. Olive Crest's mission is to, quote, transform the lives of at-risk children through the power of family. Transform the lives of at-risk children through the power of family. Just in 2020, Olive Crest was able to intervene in the lives of nearly 24,000 at-risk kids and families. It is a powerful ministry. And I thought of Olive Crest because of an image Paul uses we just heard in Romans 2. But before we get into that, let's take three minutes to, learn, to uh, hear from Angelina. I do want to forewarn you especially if you have kids watching at home. Uh, Her story begins right at the beginning with references to uh, drug use and references to abuse as well, just so you have a little fair warning there. My mom got caught doing drugs, and so we went to a family, and that family had horrible people living in it. They abused me and my brother and all the other kids who were there in that home. We went home after six months. And so I was with my cousins for like about, I want to say a year. But I'd never told them what the family did to me because I was just scared. Like, I thought that maybe they were going to be ashamed of me for something I did. I don't know. My mom all, all of a sudden just showed up out of nowhere. She took us out one day. We walked 25 miles to Huntington Beach, and she went to the bathroom, and then she left me there. She didn't come back. I went to the ticket booth lady. They told me um, they were going to take me to a lifeguard, so I stayed underneath the lifeguard tower for like an hour or two. After that, they showed me where my mom was. She was halfway up the beach, and my mom um, was surrounded by police and She was lying, saying like, oh yeah, no, I never had a daughter. Like, you're totally lying to me. Like, she's not my daughter. So they just asked a bunch of questions, like what grade I was in, and I had no clue because I never went to school ever. I went to a foster home, and I was terrified because I thought that it was just going to be everything all over again. 
And that's when I got introduced to Olive Crest. Scott and I were struggling with how we were going to start a family, and we knew that it wasn't happening for us biologically. So we started fostering with Olive Crest about eight years ago. We've had 15 different children come through our house. Six of them have stayed. Our oldest is Angelina. She's 12. I'll just never forget it. We were driving one day, and she said, Mom, you just treat me a lot differently. And I said, I treat you differently? I said, is that okay? Like She said, you just treat me a lot better than my mom treated me. It was so reassuring to know that she saw the difference of how she is supposed to be kept safe and loved and provided for. She's only like been ours officially for three years and everything she's accomplished. Like she was singing at the graduation up on stage with the ukulele that she just taught herself to play on YouTube a couple months ago. And she was a kid that came to us so shy and so scared and has accomplished so much more than she would have ever in the situation she was in before. And Olive Crest has walked alongside us and we are just so blessed to be the Ashford Party of Eight. I feel like it was really a blessing and a miracle that God has brought me to this family and has blessed me with so much love and showed me how this big crazy family can really be something that I actually need. God showed me how this big, crazy family is something that I actually need. The wisdom of an adopted child. We're going to come back to Angelina's story here and there because it happens kind of quick. I've seen it like 10 times now, right? But uh, you haven't. So I'll come back to a couple of details as we go along. But I want you to keep her story in mind as we look at Ephesians chapter 1. Starting in verse 5, Paul is still in the process, remember, of redefining our identity in Christ. So let's listen for God's word. In love, he, meaning God, predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. This is the word of the Lord. We say thanks be to God. There are certain things that all human beings share in common, lots of things. A couple things I want to highlight. One, we are all beginning life as children. And as my therapist told me once, (laughs) we're all still children, folks, right? The eight-year-old in us, the two-year-old, the 16-year-old, still there, right? So we know what it is to be children. And also, the second one, we are also created by God, creatures in God's image, specifically as human beings. So it's a common turn of phrase in the church and actually in the culture right now, too, to call all human beings children of God. Nod ahead or raise a hand if you've heard all humanity referred to as children of God. Yes? Yes. I'm not going to refute that, right? Because as such, I suppose we are. Because I just gave us two reasons why we can think that way. But we are born into a human family. Jesus said humans can reproduce only human life. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives birth to spiritual life. Now, as human beings, we give birth to brokenness. We are broken and we have broken kids, We were broken when we were born, and we pass that along. We inherit evil, we inherit sin, and we choose sin at some level as well. And so if you like to think of all humanity as children of God, you certainly may, but at least understand that we are at-risk children, to use Olive Crest's language, or Angelina's life. Was Angelina born a child of God? Sure, but at risk. And spiritually speaking, something Paul is trying to help the Ephesians understand, we are, all, we are all at risk children outside of Jesus Christ. Because though God created each of us, sin and evil force us to live like orphans. Children, yes, but hurt, alone, and with no power to create a future for ourselves. 
Picture Angelina huddled beneath the lifeguard tower with no power at all. That's the condition we're in, in brokenness. Children though we may be. And as troubling as that image is, it is exactly where the good news comes in. That in Jesus Christ, we are adopted and made God's children in a very new way. Paul develops the adoption metaphor much more in his letter to the Romans, which we heard part of earlier. You received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father. That adoption plays out in at least three ways we're going to look at briefly today. One, our adoption in Christ heals what is broken. We are healed in that adoption. Paul uses the words redemption, the forgiveness of sins in verse 7 of today's passage from Ephesians. Now, I'm willing to bet when most of us hear the idea of forgiveness of sins, we probably think of our own moral failings. I picture the Roman Catholic confession booth, for example, where I go and I basically just say all the stuff I have done wrong. And in a sense, that is exactly what forgiveness of sins is. But sin is much bigger than any one of us and much bigger than any one of our failings. For example, the Bible addresses the sin of whole nations Look at the book of Jonah. The Bible addresses human corrupt systems. Look at the book of Amos. So therefore, Christ's victory over sin is not just His victory over your personal naughtiness. It is His victory over that larger sin that the world remains broken in, the sins of past generations, the sins of corrupt systems. And the kingdom of God which will one day be fulfilled, is in Christ already breaking in to this world and healing it. Actually, in Jesus' healing stories in the gospel, those healing stories are not just a way for people to convince people to believe in him. In fact, he even said, you ask for miracles, and I'm telling you, they don't work when it comes to convincing you. Did they work? No, they still killed him. But what those healing stories are, are evidence of the healing that has already begun that will one day be completed. You guys with me? Cool. Yeah. So sin, way bigger than just you. And therefore, healing and redemption, way bigger than just you. Surely this is good news at any time, but especially into a divided and divisive culture. Jesus is good news for individuals, but more importantly, good news for a torn community. If a Christian community, a church, a small group, which is still a community, right? It's a small community, Christian school, what have you. If a Christian community is struggling with disagreements that lead to division, I wonder, and I think Paul wondered too, what would happen if members of that community chose to spend a season considering their own perspectives less. To use John the Baptist's words, to decrease. So that God's perspective and Jesus himself might what? Increase. What would happen, I wonder, in a divided Christian community if that was actually what we chose to do? In Christ, we share a common redemption. Remember, you got to keep that context in mind because things like adoption and stuff like that, it does get so personal. And it's so about me, but not as much here because we remember Paul's context. He's trying to talk to a group who some of them thought for sure they were God's kids, but not those guys. And Paul's saying, no, you're all at-risk children. And therefore, You are all adopted. You are all broken, and therefore you are all healed in Christ. It unifies us. It's communal. A child isn't adopted into nothing. The definition of adoption means family, and that family then means belonging. That's the second point. Our adoption in Christ offers us belonging. We're commanded to respect the intrinsic dignity of all human beings, the good old golden rule. We've heard it, right? But within the church, (laughs) that command is way more specific. 
This, these are not just people you're sitting next to in these pews or you're seeing in the chat window. These are your siblings, your brothers, your sisters, not just anybody. Jesus even referred to his followers, his own followers, as his brother, his sister, and even his mother. I bet that made his mom feel great. But that's what he said. Paul's audience for this letter comprises people of Jewish descent who will hear that language of family and go, yeah, we know. They knew. They were kind of like a bunch of distant cousins. If you go back far enough in the biblical history, right? right? The 12 sons of Jacob, and then all those sons became the tribes. So they're like these sort of distant cousins. They know that they're part of the family, but not their non-Jewish Christian brothers and sisters, they didn't share that family history. They came from the outside. They were outsiders to it. And that insider-outsider conflict was threatening a sense of belonging, especially for those non-Jewish Christians. And Paul is clear, though. His audience, both Jew and Gentile, both broken, both redeemed, now having all been adopted, they all belong. They are all in the family. My brother Pat and his wife and two daughters uh, let me, they gave me permission to share this. Uh, they joined, recently joined St. Catherine Greek Orthodox Church in the Denver area. They are so excited about it, and I'm excited for them because they have renewed a relationship with God and with Christ. I'm just so excited for them. And part of their conversion and joining that church was that they were required to choose godparents. Not, not optional, required for any new member of that church. And if they didn't choose, the priest was going to assign them a godparent. Not only the adults, but the kids too. They each have their own godparent who is already a member of that congregation. They take family very seriously as a metaphor for faith. My brother calls his godmother Yaya, which in Greek means grandma. He actually said she's kind of the grandma for the whole parish, actually. And I asked her to tell me about him, I asked him to tell me about her. And he said she teaches him all kinds of stuff. She's always there, always greets him. She's teaching him Greek. She's, you know, she's his grandma in the faith. Actually, when they did finally join the church, which took a while, uh, their godparents threw them a party, including a cake that said, welcome home. I've seen the picture. Welcome home. Now, different traditions will have different ways of welcoming people into their congregations but all of the ways we welcome people should reflect our common adoption, our healing, yes, but that belonging, that belonging. And that joy is not just reserved for pastors and programs. Each of us is called, each of you is called to be that welcomer. Don't wait for Pastor Aaron or me to figure out some kind of mentorship program for you. I don't, I don't know. I could try. You can feel my like, but what's stopping you from finding that person saying, hey, are you new? Let me take you for coffee. Nothing's stopping you. Now, we'll support you and we want that to happen, but just imagine the potential for really welcoming people into the belonging family of Christ. In one way, when Pat and Mona found that church and they were welcomed home with their cake and everything, it probably felt like a finish line, right? Right? But in another very important way, it's a beginning. Because our adoption in Christ guarantees our future. You might have noticed the gender-specific language in the NIV today. Uh, Paul's phrase here is adoption to sonship. Did you notice that? Adoption to sonship? To being a son? Okay. Some translations actually eliminate that. They shouldn't. And here's why. Uh, It's actually only one word in Greek, adoption, But it does specifically mean being placed in a family as a son. It's a compound word in Greek, actually, that basically means son placement. Son placement in a family, okay? Here's the significance. Are you guys listening? Because I want to make sure you hear me. Don't walk away mishearing me. This has zero to do with gender. Okay, good. You're, You're there. Same Paul who wrote, in Christ there is no male nor female. Do you think Paul now turns around and goes, by the way, this is just for the guys? No, it's absurd. Okay, 
So what's he saying? Well, it, it lies in ancient uh, systems of inheritance. It lies in how inheritance was understood. And women were almost completely excluded from Greco-Roman systems of inheritance. They simply weren't ever heirs. It was the men, the sons, that were the heirs. That's why Paul uses the phrase adoption to sonship, is adoption to the status of having full access to everything that is the Father's. And that, of course, applies to anyone who is in Christ. Now, again, the Jewish Christians in Paul's audience, again, this is the fourth time since last week that I've said this, uh, they're sitting there going, "Uh uh-huh, we know, we know. In the, in the Hebrew Bible, God calls His people His inheritance. They know this, but not their non-Jewish Christian counterparts. You think that then when they went to the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, this massive football field-sized temple, that they walked away going, she's going to adopt me as her own. No way. And what about when they worshipped Caesar as their God? Did Caesar promise all of the people who worshipped him an inheritance of his own personal kingdom? Of course not. This is a brand new idea to these Gentiles in Ephesus. And I hope you're seeing that pattern of insider, outsider divisiveness that was happening that Paul is very aware of and, t- and writing to that threatens the gospel itself. That's why it's so important. Paul's interest, remember, not just in unity, Unity is the result. Paul's interest is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that very gospel is threatened when we let anything else divide us. And Paul knew it, and that's exactly what he's writing to. So he uses that adoption metaphor for uh, healing, for belonging, and for a future hope, inheritance. Very briefly, I just want to give one more example. I talked to a friend of mine who was adopted. He knew he was adopted as long as he can remember. His his adoptive parents told him very young. And he told me that he really never experienced the kind of pain that Angelina from our video uh, experienced. So he couldn't really relate to that. But what he did tell me was that he learned later in life that his biological mom had had him far too young to be able to provide him a stable life or any sense of stable future. And so when he was adopted, he said that his parents raised him in such a way that he, quote, he knew he would, quote, go to college, have a job, provide for his family, be educated in such a way as to be a positive, contributing member of society. His adoptive parents gave him an inheritance, not of money necessarily, but an inheritance of hope, an inheritance of assurance, of confidence I am going to be okay, was the way he was raised. And that was the gift of his adoption. And just as he's, his adoptive parents left him a legacy that he can now pass on to his own family, so also those saints in Christ who have gone before us left each and every single one of us a legacy. No one comes to Christ without somebody introducing us to Christ. Somebody went before us. And that legacy is what we now enjoy and what we are obligated by Jesus himself when he commands us to make disciples. We're obligated to share that legacy, to open up the family of God to anyone who needs it, anyone who's ready for it, anyone orphaned by pain or by loneliness or by hopelessness, to seek them out and embrace them with Christ's healing and belonging, and inheritance so that we can all be in the family together. Let's pray. Living God, you offer us such good news that's a balm for our spirit and at the same time a challenge for our minds and our wills. Will you come, Holy Spirit? Highlight for us in our minds and especially in our hearts exactly what you need us to hear. Get rid of anything we don't need so we walk out of here changed and empowered to become more like you today than we were yesterday. May it be so in your name. Amen.